How are y'all doing? Are you a little confused by the Christmas bumper video? Are you curious about the, the presents on the stage? Well, here's the deal. It's only 101 days until Christmas. Some of the women just panicked because they're already behind in their Christmas shopping. The dudes all relaxed because we know we still got another 100 days before we have to stop, start Christmas shopping. <laughs> but I want you to do me a favor this morning. I want you to get an image of Santa Claus in your mind, if you would. All right? We've done a little help here on the stage. I'm actually wearing a red shirt. Yeah. Ate a few donuts this week to kind of help out. If you need to close your eyes, go, ahead, go ahead and do that. You have the image. It's a loving face, white beard, uh, cheerful. And, and look, we know Santa's powers. We've done the research from the song Santa Claus is Coming to Town. Uh, he knows if you've been sleeping. He knows if you're awake. So he, he kind of knows what you're doing. And we also know that he knows if you've been good or bad. So what? Be good for goodness sakes. And, and so he has some expectations of us, but does he really care? I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, my experience growing up was in the end, the old man caves towards the end and takes everybody off the naughty list. That's been my experience with him. And some of you guys kind of think about God the same way. You think about this old man that with a loving face and a white beard and same thing. He's got some expectations, but in the end, is he really all that serious about it? Some of you have you kind of bought into what I call the Santa Claus myth. And that's where you see God, the all-powerful God of the universe, kind of like Santa Claus. And, and the reality in this Santa Claus myth is that both Santa Claus and God exist for this, presents. Christmas time, Santa comes down the chimney, brings us presents. And if we're honest, for a lot of us, our prayers kind of wind up being almost Christmas wish lists, where we pray that... God would give us health or take away a problem that we have, that God would give us a better job or a better husband or a better wife or better kids. And then we're kind of disappointed when God doesn't come down the chimney and deliver what we ask him for, and we get upset with God. Several years ago, our family traveled on vacation to Turkey, and we got the opportunity to go to the ancient city of Ephesus, which really was amazing. We got to go to the, the ancient kind of uh, theater where Paul probably preached. Back then, it would have seated about 24,000 people. And the construction of that is so amazing because even today, you can stand down on the stage area and you can talk with a little projection. And all the way up in the top of that theater, people can hear and understand what you're saying with no microphone. That's how amazing the design of that was by the Romans. Well, after we were done in the ancient city of Ephesus, we went to a place called Mary's house. And it's this ancient house where uh, some people believe that uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, may have lived out her last days near Ephesus with the apostle John and his family. And they built a Catholic church there as well near Mary's house. And they've also built something that's called the wishing wall. And it's this wall where you can write a note to Jesus and you can make a request and you can put it up on this wall. And over time, this wall has kind of been, become broken into three different sections. There is one section of the wall is on your prayers for health or healing. Another section is your requests for wealth, if you want to change in your financial circumstances. And the last section is your pleas for love, where you can, if you want something to change uh, in your love life, you can put that up. And I can still remember standing there in front of that wall thinking, oh my goodness, we have reduced the almighty God of the universe, the creator of every single thing. We've kind of reduced him down to kind of a Santa Claus figure. And we've decided that he's like, you know, a genie in a bottle or Santa Claus that only shows up when we need him, an old man with a kindly old face that brings us presents of health and wealth and love. And here's another similarity between Santa Claus and God that we kind of get in this Santa Claus myth, is Santa Claus only really shows up around the holidays, kind of leaves us alone the rest of the year, and he shows up with presents. And so many of us, that's really what we want God to do too. We want him to, to kind of only show up around the holidays or when we need something. And, and then we kind of feel like we've switched places with God, almost like the re relationship is reversed. We get to tell God the areas of our life that we need his help in, 
but we also get to tell him the areas of our life that it's probably best if he just kind of stay out of. So here's the lie we're tackling today. I know what's best. This is a tough one because this lie and the truth that we're going to talk about that destroys the lie hits us right in the pride. And it can upset us. And some of you guys are going to probably be frustrated with me before this sermon is over because we think we know what's best for us. And this plays out in a lot of different ways. Some people think that they've got some unique circumstances in their life that means that God's law, God's rules that they read about don't apply to their unique circumstances. Like I've had couples uh, that are living together outside marriage tell me that, you know, we've prayed about this and, and, and God is okay with what we're doing because uh, we really love each other and we're committed. It's just not the right time for us to, to get married. I'm like, huh, I didn't know that's the way that worked. I've talked to some other people that say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I have really a private faith. My faith is really on the inside. And so I don't really go to church and I don't really do anything that the Bible tells me to, to do, but I have my own kind of relationship with Jesus. And, and I look at that and I'm like, I don't see that kind of Christianity in the Bible, but, but I get why you want it. <laughs> well, that's kind of awesome if you think about it. You don't have any of the responsibilities or the obligation and you get the biggest benefit of being a Christian, you get you know, the ticket to eternal life. Here's the bottom line for a lot of us. We want to be the boss of us. We want to be our own God. But when we do that, we're committing what I think is the sin that God hates most. It's the sin of arrogance and pride. We're elevating ourselves to think that we can know better than God what is best for us. In my study of the Bible, I think pride is the sin that God hates most. I've looked, we talk about other sins more probably as a church than we do pride. But if you look at what the Bible has to say, it's pretty clear God does not like pride. Look at Proverbs 16, 5. The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. I don't know that I want God detesting me. How about this one, Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. How about what James, the half-brother of Jesus, says in the New Testament in James 4, 6. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. I don't know that I want God opposing me. And the reality is, these are just three examples, but you can go all through the Bible and find where God says he detests the arrogant and the prideful. See, here's why. When we understand what the Bible has to say about how we're supposed to think or act or lo live or love, and we go, you know, I get that, but I don't really agree with this one. This one I don't like as well. I'm going to kind of put this one on the, the back shelf and not really focus on this. Here's what you're really saying to the God of the universe. God, look, I, I get that you've been around an eternity. I know it's a lot of time. I get it. And I get that you've made a universe that I don't really even understand. You've made a billion, trillion stars, whatever it is. I can't count them. But, you know, I think I know better than you when it comes to this particular area. And, and God, because you're omniscient, because you know everything, you know I've got 56 years of kind of running this life got some pretty good experience. And oh, by the way, I built a few things along the way myself. And so I think I know better than you how my life ought to work. Do you hear how goofy that sounds when I say it out loud? Now, you're not using those words. You're not saying it in that way. But that is what you're saying to God when you modify his truth to fit what you like or to fit your perspective. The reality is this. If your God agrees with you on all your opinions and views on politics, on social issues, and on honesty and truth, if he, believe, if he agrees with you, you're not worshiping the God of the universe. You've, you've got a different God. Now, here's the cool thing about your God is when you're brushing your teeth in the morning, you can see your God face to face in the mirror. But that's not the one true God. It's an idol. It's every bit as much an idol as if you set up a little Buddha doll in your bedroom and bowed down and worshiping that. You've made yourself your own God. But our God is not Santa Claus. He's not some caricature of an old man that brings us gifts. 
couple of months ago, somebody was telling me that they've decided that they believe in extraterrestrial aliens. And I said, all right, well, what do you base that on? They said, here's why. If it were just us in the universe, on, here on Earth, the universe wouldn't need to be so big. We wouldn't need so many galaxies and stars just for us. And so there has to be other life on other planets. And I stopped for a second and I said, I would agree with you if the universe were made for us. But, but the universe isn't made for us. The universe is made for God. And given how I understand how big and powerful and majestic our God is, the universe is probably about right for him. So here's my best shot at describing the God that we worship. And this is going to still fall completely short of who he is. God is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is outside of space and time. Our universe isn't big enough to contain him, to hold him in. He is an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present creator God. The sunsets you like to watch, like he painted those. The waves you like to hear crash into the shore when you're on your beach vacation, he's driving those. The mountains you like to climb up and ski down, he made those. All those stars you like to look up in the sky and see, every one of them belongs to him. Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to Psalm 139. This is a beautiful psalm that was written by King David in the Old Testament. Now, if you've been around church much, you've probably heard this psalm, or at least a portion of this, ser- this psalm, may, but you may not have heard it in the context that we're talking about today. But as I was preparing for this sermon and I was looking through different passages of Scripture, I realized that this psalm busts the lie, I know what's best, and it tells us the truth, that God knows what's best, and he has the right and the authority to tell you what that is. All right, let's get started. Look at Psalm 139. Let's start with verses 1 through 6. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to obtain. So here is the first truth that King David is telling us. He's busting the lie. I know what's best. And he's telling us, God knows what's best. First of all, he knows you. So King David is saying, God, you know me. You know when I get up. You know when I lie down. You know when I'm asleep, when I'm awake. You know the big things about me. You know the little things about me. And then he says, God, you know more about me than I even know about myself. And we have the same thing. One of the descriptions that we use for God is omniscient. In other words, nothing is beyond his comprehension and nothing is outside of his view and his knowledge. King David is saying God is omniscient, but he's also saying something way more personal than that. He's not just saying God knows everything. He's saying God knows you. God knows the big things about you. God knows the little things about you. He knows when you wake up and when you go to sleep. He knows when you sit down. He knows when you're eating a meal. You know, Jesus said this same thing in a different way in the New Testament. He said, God knows every hair on your head. Now, for Pastor Sean, that's a little easier to know. I might could count those if I had to, but for most of us, that's a big deal. And God doesn't just know the hairs on your head. He knows the hairs on billions of people's head. He knows exactly how many there are. God knows you intimately. God knows every detail about you, every desire, every thought. He knows every good thing that you've ever done. He knows every bad thing that you've ever done. He knows every bad thing that you've even thought about doing. He knows all your faults, all your failures, all your hang-ups, all your sin, all the different things that you struggle with. He knows you intimately. But that's not even the most amazing part of this. What's the most amazing is that he knows all of that detail about you. And he loves you anyway. He loves you with a passion you can't even begin to understand. Despite all of those things that we know about ourselves, God sees those things and he loves us. See, here's where I think we mess up when we try to figure out what God thinks about us. We think that God thinks about us what we think about us. 
Does that make sense? In other words, I think that God likes the things that I like about myself, the things I think I'm pretty good at, but that God probably doesn't like some of the things that I don't like about myself. Like I've got a lot of faults and failures. I, I mean, I wish I was better looking. I wish I was in better shape. I wish I could sing and play the guitar. I've got all of these different things going on that make me not like myself all that much. And, and so I think about those things and my struggles and the thoughts that kind of bring me down and I don't like, and I think God must think about me what I think about me. Now, another mistake you can make is thinking that God thinks about you what you think other people think about you. In other words, whatever you feel like people feel about you, you think that God thinks the same thing. But neither one of those things are accurate about what God thinks about you. When you follow Jesus, God does not see your faults and failures and see you that way. He doesn't love you any less when you are not doing well in your own mind or in the people around you's mind. He sees you as holy and righteous. In fact, what he sees, he sees his son Jesus and his blood and his perfection. Look at how the Apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He says, God made him who had no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. God looks at us and he doesn't see our faults and failures. He sees perfection. He sees us as his children who he loves with a love that we don't even love ourselves with. He loves you and cares more about you than you can even love and care about yourself. And, and so God knows what's best for you because he knows you intimately and completely. All right, let's keep going. Look at verses 7 through 12. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, God, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the, uh, even there, I'm sorry, far side of the sea, so, uh, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even in the darkness, it will, be as, it will not be dark for you. It will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. So what David is saying, there's nowhere I can get away from you, God. Wherever I go, whether it's the depths of the oceans, it's in the vastness of outer space, wherever I were to go, God, you're there. Because God, you own all of those things. And we're going to see that that's where God's authority comes from. The U.S. Supreme Court has been in the news a lot over the last couple of years, and they've handed down some decisions that some of you may like, some of you may not like. But we can all agree that it's impacted the, our country in some pretty significant ways. And, and so some of you might go, well, what is their authority to issue those rulings? Well, the, the Supreme Court's authority comes from the U.S. Constitution that gives them that power. Our president and our Congress and our state legislatures all have their authority from a constitution, but also because they are elected by the people. Your boss has the authority to tell you what to do at work because they either own the business or they've been put in charge to make those decisions by the people that own the business. And so they have the authority to set those expectations for us at work. So what's God's authority for us? What's his authority to tell us what's best and how to live? And, and so here's the second point. God knows what's best. He made everything. See, God made a universe that we can't even get our minds around. Just our little subdivision of the universe, the little Milky Way galaxy where we live, that has between 200 and 400 billion stars. And that's just one of a billion galaxies that we know about. That's just our little corner of the galaxy. And God created the universe easily. He didn't have to work at it. Listen to what the Bible says of, about this. It says in Psalm 33, 6, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. In other words, God just said, let there be light. And suddenly, the universe exploded into existence. You know, I, I often say that if you can believe the very first verse in the Bible, Genesis 1.1, that the rest of the Bible, Jesus rising from the dead, that's easy. That's not that tough. If you can get past Genesis 1-1, you can believe everything in the Bible. And it's the most powerful verse in all the Bible. In the beginning, God created everything. That's, that's his authority. Look, I, I don't know how to build even one star. 
which I'm probably not a good example of that because I also don't know how to build a birdhouse, so I'm not a real good example. But you don't know how to build a star either, not even one. And God built a billion trillion of them just like that. And so when he built a universe that we don't even understand, he's got the right to decide what happens in that universe. Sometimes it helps me to remember my place if I'll go outside at night. I don't know if you've ever done this, but sometimes on a clear night I'll go out and I'll sit and try to get away from the light a little bit and sit and I'll look up at the night sky and I'll see those stars. And I'll remind myself that I'm just one of billions of people on this little planet. But there's a billion trillion planets circling a billion trillion stars and God made every single one of those. And it reminds me how little I am. And that's actually a good thing. It reminds me that we worship a big, big God. It's God's universe, and so he has the authority and the right to make the rules. Can I, can I let you guys in on a little secret? Like, if I were God, I'd probably do some things different. And I think when you hear some of my plan, you might actually vote for me. You wait and hold it, but I think you might vote for me for God when you kind of hear what my plan is. So first of all, I'd get rid of calories altogether, just gone. Yeah, we're just not, see, I already have a boat right there. Just made one. Actually, you know what? I, I don't think I'm going to do that. I'm going to make broccoli and kale high calorie. They're fattening. Bacon cheeseburgers, that's a diet food. Pepperoni pizza, that is a healthy, that's a heart healthy snack. I probably would, you know, maybe make bacon like this, what is a superfood? And I'd make Brussels sprouts, and I'd just get rid of Brussels sprouts all together. <laughs> That's right, everybody be skinny. How about this one? I bet I can get some votes here. I'd get rid of fire ants, gone. <laughs> mosquitoes, gone. Right? Yeah, I got, that's what you got to do to get an amen. You got to get rid of mosquitoes. And, and I think I would make gravity more optional rather than mandatory. In other words, you could kind of turn it off and on when you want to. And, and then I look at the Bible and, you know, I might change a few things there, too. I probably wouldn't be so serious about a few things. I'd probably have a few less rules. I think I'd get rid of the whole big punishment at the end of life thing. I'd think more of a progressive punishment system. So, like, if you do something that I don't think is all that big a deal, but, it, you know, you need to be reminded, just in the back of the head as you're walking down the road. And, and that's probably how I might do things. But here's the problem with that thinking. I'm not God. I don't get to decide those rules. It's not my universe. But I will say this as I've gotten older, I start to understand why God does things the way he does a little better than I probably did when I was young. But even those things I still don't understand or those things that I don't fully agree with, I have to submit to those things because he is God and I am not. I I love how J. Vernon McGee says this. He says, this is God's universe and God does his things his way. Now, you may have a better way, but you don't have a universe. That's such an obvious truth for us. But still, we don't get it. We still want to be God of us. We want to decide what's best. He created the universe out of nothingness. That gives him the right to make the rules. He doesn't need our consent or our approval. It's not up for election. It's not up for debate. These are his laws. But but so often our pride... gets in the way a little bit, and we think we know better than God about how his universe should run and how it should be governed. Now, some of you guys may be sitting there thinking, Nathan, I don't think I'd do that. But, but let's talk about that for just a minute. Maybe some things that you kind of rewrite a little bit. God created marriage, and then he says that there's one right context for sexual intimacy. It's a lifelong marriage between one man and one woman. And we say, oh, God, that, surely that can't apply to us. We, we love one another. We're just not in a place where it's, we can be, get married yet. And there's all these different reasons why, God, that shouldn't really apply to me. But God has a rule. We also say, look, that, surely that doesn't apply to two people of the same sex who love one another and are committed to a lifetime together and who have a, a certificate, marriage license from the state of Texas. Surely that doesn't apply. But God said there's one context for sexual intimacy, 
a lifelong marriage between one man and one woman. And we even try to help God out. We kind of go and we try to rewrite the Bible a little bit. So we say, look, don't really look at Romans 1. Don't really look at the Old Testament because that's gone and outdated. And then if we kind of look at a few other passages and we kind of creatively interpret them, we can kind of help God out. And, and we feel good about it. Even churches and preachers are doing it because we think, God, you would be so much more popular if you just kind of look at it a little different way. But God is not interested in our help, and he's not looking for popularity through his rules. We should make God popular through his love. That's our job. In Matthew 19, Jesus says that the only reason for divorce and remarriage that's appropriate is sexual unfaithfulness of the spouse. And, and if I were God, I think I'd probably add a few more reasons for a valid divorce and remarriage. But I'm not God, and I don't get to decide that. How about forgiveness? God's word says that we're to forgive over and over. No matter how bad we've been hurt, no matter how many times we've been hurt, no matter how bad it hurt us, we're told to forgive. In fact, Jesus was so serious about it that in Luke chapter 6, he says that if you don't forgive other people, God may not forgive you. And yet we say, God, look, if you knew my circumstance, if you knew how badly that person has hurt me, you'd be okay with me not forgiving. But God didn't make an exception. He said, forgive. God tells husbands to love their wives unconditionally, whether they've earned it or not. God tells wives to respect their husbands, whether they've earned it or not. And, and we say, but God, you don't know how big a nag my wife is. You don't know how big a jerk my husband is. Surely I'm not called to love them unconditionally in that circumstance. But that's not God's rule. If there's anybody I haven't offended yet, maybe I'll catch you with this last one. God says we're to be generous back to him through his church. Over and over through the Bible, he says that. At one point in Luke 6, 21, Jesus says that, that our love is kind of shown by how we allocate our resources. And yet we say, God, I mean, I'm having a hard time paying the rent. I'm having a hard time getting by. You know how much stress and worry that finances cause me. Maybe some other point in time I'll be in a better situation to give generously back to you. And, and oh, by the way, God, I serve in lots of other ways. I, I go to church and I do all these different things. And, and so we want to let ourselves off the hook. That's not how it works. God created the universe and it gives him the right to decide what's best. All right, look at the last part of our scripture for today. This is verses 13 through 18. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. In this last part, David is saying the last reason why God knows best. God knows best because he made you. He knows you even better than you know you. Like I drive a Ford Expedition right now, and I know a decent about, about my SUV. I know how to work most of the computer stuff that's in, you know, there by the driver's spot. Um, you know, I don't know it nearly as well as Ford does, though. Ford knows intimate detail about my SUV because they created it and they made it. They know exactly how many bolts and welds it takes to hold it together. They know how to maintain the engine best and how to take care of your transmission. If I'm honest, I don't even exactly know where my transmission is. The same thing is true with God. He made you. He knows you better than you know yourself. And while you may not have heard Psalm 139 in the context of why God knows what's best for you, you may have heard this scripture used as it relates to God's love and passion about unborn babies. That's a, a, a place where this comes into play. This scripture is talking about the amazing creation of you. Before you were even born, God has this incredible love for you. He loved you every bit as much while you were in the womb as he loves you today. This, verse, this passage makes clear that God's love and his fascination starts way before we're born. We are made in God's image. The Bible says we are image bearers of God. We made to be like him. You know, I have two dogs, and I love my dogs. And 
I would do almost anything for my dogs. But their value is not the same. The value of their life can't even compete. No matter who you are, no matter what stage of life you're in, what your age is, what your health condition is, what your mental condition is, you have a unique, precious nature to God. He loves you passionately. And this value that God places on us happens long before we're even born. It happens in the womb. That's what God says. And if that's God's law, then who are we to want to tweak that and change that? But see, we think so highly of ourselves as a culture that we say, all right, well, yeah, there, there, there can't be right. It certainly can't be right in all circumstances. And then we come up with these rare exceptions and we say, well, what about in this situation, rape or incest? And uh, what about, you know, in a situation where the child's going to be abused as a child? Or, our, man, our, our system of adoption and foster care is such a mess. Maybe abortion is not wrong. Or at least maybe it's not wrong in certain circumstances. Surely, God has some exceptions. And, and those extreme examples, those are terrible, terrible situations. But they don't change the value that God places on us and unborn babies. And it doesn't allow us to decide that we know better than God. Look, I agree that the foster system is a big old train wreck. We can agree with that. But where God's church comes in isn't rewriting God's law, it's making the world better for single moms. That's what we need to be doing. We need to be helping out with foster care and adoption. We need to be helping young single moms. We partner with a mission organization called Two Lives Change, and that's exactly what they do. They try to convince young single moms not to have abortion, but they go way further than that. Once they become single moms, they partner with them. They train them on how to take care of their child. They help get them jobs. They show them what it looks like. They provide supplies and support for them in taking care of their kids. The solution to this problem isn't rewriting God's law. The solution to this problem is being God's church and loving and taking care of people who need it. God's clear in the Bible about the rules he wants us to live by. And see, the only way you can come to some other conclusion is you think so highly of yourself that you think you know better than God what's best for you and his universe. And so we, we want to tweak it. We want to modify it just a little bit to just make it feel a little more fair. But there's one God, and it isn't me. That There's one God, and it isn't you. When you've been around even just a thousand years, or you make one star, even just one planet, then maybe we can talk. But until that happens, understand God's been around forever. He's built a billion trillion stars. There's one God and it isn't me. There's one God and it isn't you. God is God and you are not. So thinking we somehow know better than God is really, that's the sin of arrogance and pride. God designed mankind in his own image. He designed us, he made us. And so he knows us even better than we know ourselves. He knows what's best for us. And he doesn't just know what's best for us in this moment. That's kind of the way we view what's best for us is what do I need right now? But he knows what's best for us in the scope of eternity. And that's a viewpoint we can't even compete with because he's already been around in eternity and we haven't. Now we will, but we haven't yet. And so he knows what's best for us individually and he knows what's best for his children. Look, I'm not saying these rules are always easy to follow. They're not. And I'm not saying that there's not forgiveness when we, don't, when we mess up. We all mess up. Every single one of us, we stumble and fall. And what I told you earlier remains true. God loves us every bit as much in that moment as he did when we were in church doing exactly what we think we should do. There's forgiveness when we fail. But, but here's what I am saying. I'm saying when you decide whether you can support God's law, even when you don't fully understand it, and even when you don't agree with it, you really see who's on the throne of your life. You get to see who is in charge of what's going on. The reality is this. Submission is only submission when you don't agree. Think about that for a second. Like you say, I follow somebody, you follow my boss, and he's doing a good job of leading us, so we're all following. You're not following your boss. You just happen to be going in the same direction. 
It's only in those moments where we disagree or when we don't understand, that's surrender. When we say, I don't get what you're saying, God, but I follow you anyway. And so the question you have to ask yourself is, do I trust and love God enough to surrender to his will, even when I don't like it, even when I don't understand it, even when I don't agree? That's surrender. When my wife and I, when we ride together in a car, I usually drive. And so I think it's fair to say that she's surrendered control of the car to me. She lets me drive the car. But that surrender is, is, is not complete surrender. There are some limitations and some reservations that she has made. She reserves the right to critique my driving as we go, uh, to give me helpful advice whether I want it or not. She reserves the right to tell me that my driving on this day is not nearly as good as my driving on another day. Those are things she reserves. She also reserves the right sometimes to stress and worry about my driving. So she'll get nervous if she feels like I'm following too closely or traffic stopping too quick. And I can always tell, sometimes she'll make little comments, but I know she's really nervous. First, I guess we'll call it stage one, is when she grabs the, the handle up on the, the side, right? That's stage one of not trusting my driving in that moment. When she gets even more nervous, she does something bigger. She'll grab the one here with this hand and she'll reach back and grab the back one with this hand. <laughs> and then my favorite, and this happens very rarely, but sometimes she actually assumes crash position. She just goes ahead and gets in crash position before I've stopped. So she'll put, take her feet and put it up on the dashboard to, I guess, brace for the impact and use her legs to keep from hitting the, the dashboard and, and waiting for that moment of collision, which doesn't come because I wind up stopping three car lengths uh, behind the, the car in front of me. She has surrendered driving, but that surrender is not complete. And what I want to say in those moments, but I don't because I'm not stupid, is hush up and let me drive. <laughs> that may be what your spouse is thinking sometimes. There's guys right now looking at their wives going, no, baby, I never think that. Nathan, don't speak for me. But that may be what we want to say. And I think the same thing about God. As Christians, we, we do a lot of backseat driving with God. We, we question his motives. We question his rules. We stress and worry about things we can't control that he does. And here's what I think God would say back. Hush up and let me drive. I've been driving this universe for a long, long time. I've been around a long, long time. I know what's best. I know the end of the story. I know how it ends. And I got this. True surrender means accepting God's plan, God's law, God's rules, and understanding he knows best for me individually, and he knows what's best for his children collectively. True surrender means surrendering to the truth of the Bible, even when we don't agree with it, even when we don't understand it, even when we don't like it. Here's why this is so important. It's only true surrender that gives God complete lordship of our lives. It's only in that full surrender that we truly put him on the throne and surrender to him. But here's why it's so important. It's only in that full surrender when we can experience the plan God has for us, the fullness of life that he talks about in the Bible. But yet, our pride gets in the way. We keep fighting with God, even though we've already lost the war. But we can only experience true peace with God through complete surrender. Hiro Onoda was a Japanese soldier during World War II, and in 1944, he was sent to the island of Lubang in the Western Philippines to spy on American forces there. And he was told when he was dropped off at the island, you can only surrender if your commanding officer personally tells you to surrender. And, and so he began to carry out his job spying on American forces. And as you know, after a while, uh, the war ended, Japan was defeated, the Americans had won, and, and all the, the soldiers, the Japanese soldiers, either evacuated the island or they were captured. But not Anoda. Him and a few other people, they slipped into the jungle and they began to hide. And for 29 years, Anoda lived in the jungle. He lived off food that he could scavenge or steal from the local farmers, and he watched as other soldiers that he was with began to die or began to go and give themselves up in the villages. He heard messages and rumors that the war was over, but he dismissed them as lies and untruths, trying to take that away. And for 29 years after the war was over, he refused to surrender. 
29 years, he didn't change the course of the war. War was over. Japan had lost. But he didn't get to be with his family or his friends. He didn't experience fullness of life for about half of his life because he refused to surrender even when the war had ended. Only when he surrendered, finally, they literally found that he was in the the jungle and his old commanding officer came and found him and he walked out in his old uniform and gave his sword to his commanding officer and finally surrendered. Then he got to go home and be with his family. Onoda could only really win through surrender. And we can actually learn a lot about surrender from Onoda. Jesus is already victorious. God has won the war, whether we like it or not, whether we give in or not. And we can only really have a good relationship, a true relationship with him when we fully surrender. So let me ask you, what what keeps you from full surrender to God? And you've tried it your own way, doesn't seem to work. You've stressed and worried about things that you can't control. You fought even though the war war is over. How long will you? The reality is, You can only find true peace through complete surrender. Let's pray.